Welcome back to the Youth Bible in One Year, day 221. What makes you happy? Maybe it's spending time with friends, playing an instrument, playing video games, or doing something outside. Whatever it is, what is true happiness? That's our big question for today. And how do we obtain true happiness? Well, our Bible passages today have some insight into the fact that holiness leads to happiness. Now, what even is holiness? Well, we'll also answer that in today's passages. So let's see how holiness leads to happiness. The media is filled with stories of the rich, the beautiful and the strong. Our culture places these things on a pedestal and many of us aspire to achieve them. There's nothing wrong with these things, but they certainly don't always lead to happiness. The French philosopher Blaise Pascal spoke of three orders of greatness. Riches, beauty and strength fall into his first category of superficial physical greatness. Above this is a higher, second level of greatness. It's the greatness of genius, science and art, the greatness of the art of Michelangelo or the music of Bach or the brilliance of Albert Einstein. These stand way above superficial, physical greatness. However, according to Pascal, there is a third kind of greatness, the order of holiness. And there's an almost infinite qualitative difference between the second and the third category. The fact that a holy person is strong or weak, rich or poor, highly intelligent or illiterate, does not add or subtract anything because that person's greatness is on a different and almost infinitely superior plane. It is open to every one of us to achieve true greatness in the order of holiness. The word holy, hallowed, holiest, holiness, appears over 500 times in the Bible. God is holy. He gives you his Holy Spirit to sanctify you and you are called to share in his holiness. The word saints means holy ones. In the New Testament, it is applied to all Christians. You are called to be holy. Holiness is a gift you receive when you put your trust in Jesus. Receive his righteousness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Seek to live out a holy life in grateful response to God's gift through the imitation of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, only holiness leads to happiness. From Psalm 93 Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. Holy God God is the creator of all, but he is also set apart from the world he's established. He's greater and more majestic than all creation, even the thunders of mighty waters. The climax of the psalmist's praise focuses on God's holiness. He concludes, Your statutes stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days, O Lord. The NEB translates this, Holiness is the beauty of your temple. The temple was a beautiful and impressive building, but the psalmist recognizes that the holiness of God is the temple's true inner beauty and glory. Lord, we worship you in the beauty of your holiness. You alone are holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. New Testament from 1 Corinthians 5 It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast, so that you may have a new, unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. 
Holy Church. There are several pitfalls in talking about holiness in the church today. First, there's a danger of an attitude that is like, holier than thou. Avoid self-righteous superiority. Second, there's a danger of perfectionism. Only God is completely holy. Strive for excellence. But none of us will achieve perfection in this life. Our holiness is the appropriate response to God's holiness. And yet it's only made possible by the gift and the grace of God. Holiness in the church comes through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because the church is meant to be holy, Paul is horrified by what was going on in Corinth. There was gross sexual immorality of a kind that would not be tolerated even outside the church. He writes, And you're so above it all that it doesn't even faze you. Shouldn't this break your hearts? Shouldn't it bring you to your knees in tears? Shouldn't this person his conduct be confronted and dealt with? In order for the church to be holy, discipline needs to be exercised. There are some extreme sins that should result in exclusion from the church. These sins are ones that are obvious. For example, in the case of sexual immorality, it is an extreme kind of immorality between a man and his stepmother. Paul writes about the need for discipline in relation to those who are greedy, idolaters or slanderers, drunkards or swindlers. Greed here probably carries the sense of avarice to the point of robbery or swindling. Other such sins include idolatry and slander, verbal abuse, maligning and reviling people. Drunkards refers to those who willingly and persistently get drunk. Paul's focus here is not on those who are trying to overcome alcoholism or any other addiction, for whom the church should be a place of healing and not of rejection. The word here is associated with other vices, violence and unseemly sexuality. Paul makes it absolutely clear that he's not speaking about people outside of the church. We're not to dissociate ourselves from even the most extreme sinners. Jesus was a friend of sinners. He associated with everyone. These are exactly the people we should be reaching out to. Rather, Paul is saying that if people continue with these extreme and obvious sins in an unrepentant manner, they have no place in the church. Unless we deal with the issue, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. It will affect the whole church. Church discipline is therefore very positive in the sense that it enables the person to confront their own conduct and deal with it. It's also positive for the church as a whole in that it stops evil spreading through the whole church community. Thankfully, forgiveness is possible. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. None of us are holy except through the gift of God. Jesus died as the Passover lamb in order that we can be forgiven and cleansed. Holiness is a gift from God. When we fail, we need to come back to the cross without delay and receive forgiveness. Today, Lord, I come to you again and ask for your forgiveness and cleansing. Help me to lead a holy life. May your church be a holy place. Old Testament from 1 Chronicles 28 and 29 And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house as the sanctuary. Be strong and do the work. Then David gave his son Solomon the plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind. David also said to Solomon his son, Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. Then the leaders of families, the officers of tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. Anyone who had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the temple of the Lord. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent, and now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you, and give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, statutes and decrees, and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. Holy 
temple. David was called to prepare for the building of a holy temple. Because the temple was holy, David himself could not build it, since he had done too much fighting, killed too many people. However, God did guide David in the exact plans for building the temple. The plans were put into his mind by the Spirit. This is often how God guides us. He presents reasons to our minds for acting in a certain way. David entrusted the work to his son Solomon. He called him to serve God with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. God calls you, as he did Solomon, to a holiness that goes beyond action, to the heart, the motives and the thoughts. David said that God is a God who tests the heart and is pleased with integrity. David was a man of integrity of heart. This is a good definition of holiness. It's been said that everyone has three lives, a public life, a private life and a secret life. Holiness is about living an integrated life rather than a disintegrated one. Holiness is where there is ultimately no difference between our public, private and secret lives and no difference between what we profess and what we practice. Holiness is linked to wholeness. When God calls you to be holy, he's saying, be holy mine. David prayed, give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, requirements and decrees and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. It's interesting to note in passing that in order to build the temple, they needed to raise a large amount of money. They achieved it because the leaders led. The overall leader gave first, the other leaders gave next, and all the people gave willingly with a sense of celebration. God wants you to give willingly. If you are not willing, you can pray, Lord, make me willing to be made willing. And as Sandy Miller often says, at least you can pray, Lord, make me willing to be willing to be made willing. As God's people gave willingly, they were filled with great joy. Everything you have comes from God in the first place. As you give your resources to the work of God generously and freely, you are filled with great joy. The holy temple which David and Solomon built was only preparation for the holy temple of the church where the Holy Spirit dwells. Not only does the Spirit live in the church, He also lives in you. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Lord, fill me today with your Holy Spirit, I pray, and help me to be holy. Pippa adds, 1 Chronicles 29 verse 9 For they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. I'm always amazed by God's provision and the incredible generosity of the people of God. Time and again, we have seen God's extraordinary provision for the work of the church just when things began to look impossible. I don't think I thank God enough for his wonderful generosity. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are holy. Thank you that you give me holiness through your Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm sorry for where I've turned from you, where I've made my heart unclean. And Lord, I ask now that you would make me holy again. I receive your forgiveness. Make me new, Jesus. Lord, and help me to be holy in the future. Help me to live like you to live by your Spirit, and through your Spirit, and with your Spirit. Fill me up today afresh. Give me a spirit of holiness. In Jesus' name, Amen.